We'll be turning to Matthew chapter 5 this morning, beginning the Sermon on the Mount, which is the the longest continuous discourse we have of our Savior while he was here in his ministry on earth. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 all give us the substance of this message. The message is given in a more abbreviated form in the Gospel of Luke. And if you want to look at that, you'll find it uh, as you look at cross-references and so forth in your Bible. But this is the most complete rendering of that Sermon on the Mount. And what is Jesus doing at this point? He's teaching about the kingdom of heaven. You remember from, from Matthew chapter 3 and forward, it says that Jesus began to take up the banner of what John the Baptist had been preaching, which was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now in chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew, Jesus goes on to talk about that kingdom in great detail. And the fact that that kingdom isn't just something future, it's something that happens now. And therefore, we begin looking at this, starting at uh, verse 1 of chapter 5. This is one of the areas that may well have been where Christ gave the Sermon on the Mount. We're not exactly sure where it was because the text reads as follows. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. No mountain specified, just a mountain in the area apparently of Capernaum. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here he begins the Beatitudes, as they're called. We'll look at four of them today and then the the balance next week. The first of these is stated in this way, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, each of these begins with that same word, blessed. Someone has suggested that it could better be translated perhaps, or the idea of it is, Oh, the blessedness of this or that quality that Christ illustrates. In other words, this is more than a mere happiness. Yes, I have been aware of the fact that a preacher of a bygone era put out a series of messages called the Be Happy Attitudes. That really makes a trite observation on something that is far more deep. This is not just happiness, nor is it just a promise for a future blessing. He's not saying we will be blessed, but we are blessed if we have this characteristic, this quality in our lives right now. So in other words, blessed is the judgment of heaven on the character of specific individuals that we'll look at, and they're all linked Not necessarily chronological, though the first four seem to have that kind of linkage, but rather that this is the the testimony of a person who truly knows Jesus Christ, who is truly a part of this spiritual kingdom now, which will eventually be revealed in an earthly kingdom and an eternal kingdom. So these individuals are the ones singled out for God's blessing both now and forever. Does that sound like something you want? To be blessed by God now and forever. Well, that should pique our interest. And that is why Christ begins his message with these eight to nine repetitions, nine repetitions of the word blessed that seem to be in eight different beatitudes. So this being poor in spirit, we need to explore that. I put it in the notes this way, the impoverished in spirit, because the word is not just referring to those who fall below the poverty line. As has been observed by many individuals, we have some of the richest poor people in anywhere in the world in our country. There are people around the world who risk their lives to get into our country to be poor. They would love to be poor by our standards because they're far poorer, and they fit closer in an economic sense to what we're talking here, though this is far beyond an economic sense. This is an individual that, again, in that physical economic sense, would be on the streets begging for subsistence, not so that they can pay their cable bill or their cell phone. 
This is an individual who is in abject poverty. But notice the qualifier there. They are poor in spirit, impoverished in spirit. So each of these is a spiritual quality, not a physical quality that we're looking at. Now, this isn't the first time that Scripture places an emphasis on this kind of an individual. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, does the same thing and indicates to us that these are individuals upon whom God looks with special favor. Notice Isaiah 66, verse 2, the second part of that verse, which says, This is the one who, to whom I will look, he who is humble or poor, as it's sometimes translated, and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. This is this quality of being poor. It's someone who humbles themselves before God. In fact, some people just put it out there, the humble instead of the poor in spirit. These then are, as has been described by a commentator, wretched beggars who bring absolutely nothing to God but their complete emptiness and need. This is a failing of religion. That people come to God presenting their works instead of their emptiness and their need. We have that tendency as well. We don't like to see ourselves as the sinners God says we are. And so we make excuses for any number of sinful failings that is common to flesh. And we think ourselves not so bad because I haven't done X. And you know, I even found this to be true of individuals who were convicted of murder. I put it in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way that uh, if you ask them if they consider themselves a bad person, no, I didn't kill my mother. See, there's always something you can one-up or one-down. There's another rung of the ladder down below me. Don't worry about him. I'm, I'm all right. But this is not the attitude of this person. It comes to God completely empty. These are individuals who are spiritually bankrupt and destitute. They understand that they have nothing to offer God. This is the attitude expressed in Romans 7 verse 18 that says, I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. The only good that might dwell within me is what God has put there by his grace through the presence of his Holy Spirit. There is nothing else good. Jonathan Edwards, who ministered during the 1700s in a time frame that was called the Great Awakening because of the spiritual awareness that was revived during that time, one of the truly bona fide revivals in American history. There have been other times that have been called revivals that don't meet up to what the scriptural definition would be. But Jonathan Edwards had this to say, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. That's poverty of spirit. This is an ongoing attitude before God that endures and begins at repentance, but it endures all throughout life. That attitude should still be a part of us even if we have known Christ for 20 years. We should know that still in my flesh there is nothing good. But to these individuals, these impoverished in spirit, Scripture says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to note, is is in the present tense, not only in English, but also in Greek. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they possess the kingdom right now. That was startling to the people that were hearing Christ because they were used to hearing about the coming kingdom. You remember the thief on the cross? What did he say? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You remember the last question of the disciples, apparently, of Jesus Christ, one of the last big questions? When will the end of the age come and when will you establish your kingdom? It was a continual emphasis to people. They were expecting the Messiah to come and establish a political kingdom. And Jesus is here presenting himself as that Messiah, but not with a political kingdom. He says, the poor, the impoverished in spirit are now possessors of the kingdom of heaven. That means that all benefits are presently theirs. Think of the benefits of the kingdom. 
grace. What does grace, God's grace, mean to you? Undeserved favor or mercy. God's pity on your pitiful, wretched condition. Forgiveness, sonship, security, prayer. To know that prayer isn't just vain words that come out of your mouth and never ascend any higher than the ceiling. But rather that there is a God in heaven who hears the cry of your heart even if words don't come out of your mouth. He hears them as well as if you were in the throne room of heaven. And that's the access that you have. That's the kingdom. Having that relationship with God. But not only that, the future promises of a kingdom are also theirs. They will have the benefit of future kingdom blessing as well. Because again, they are blessed. They are judged to be blessed by God. And so what does the future kingdom look like for someone who has faith in Jesus Christ? Victory over death. Whether you're, a, whether you're dead or living at the coming of Jesus Christ, it won't make any difference. We'll be equally raised up together with him, never to die again. Translation to heaven, in other words, transportation. You won't even have to pay for it, and the rocket won't explode. All by God's power. Eternal dwelling with God. Can you imagine what that will be? Never mind that the streets are paved of gold. You won't even notice. Because the Lamb of God is there. And Scripture says He is the light of the city. Amazing kingdom blessings we have to be transformed completely into the image of Jesus Christ, to be like Him because we will see Him as He is. What an amazing thing. And so to the poor, the impoverished in spirit, theirs is complete salvation. You only get the salvation by going through the door of absolute destitution spiritually before God. A person who does not come to God with empty hands, without works, without religion, just simply on the merits of Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Otherwise, you don't get in. Blessed are the impoverished in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then the second of the Beatitudes from verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What is this mourning? Trust me, it's not a promise for those who have lost a loved one. Otherwise, everyone is included. But rather... This is a mourning that follows hand in hand with the impoverished spirit. When we realize how empty we are before God, and not only empty, that we are absolutely guilty. Mourning is a natural result. This is an individual who is mourning spiritually over several things, but it starts with this, a lament for the power of sin in their lives, in my life. Unless it gets to be personal, it's easy to look around the world and say how bad the world is, how immoral people are. But in, I don't know if you've noticed this recently. I was talking to someone not too long ago, and I mentioned the concept of immorality, and they said, what does that mean? Do you realize that's where we are in our world? That we have been assaulted by media, by entertainment, by whatever means you can think of to accept as normal the things that God condemns. And we're not just talking about the things that other people do, we're talking about the things that are in our lives. And it's been successful because even Christians don't have a concept of what right and wrong is. To truly lament over our sins is the result of that impoverished spirit that we cannot stand how far we have fallen and how much we have turned away from God and marred that image that he placed within us. 
2 Corinthians 7, 14 says, Godly grief, sorrow, produces a repentance that leads to salvation that is without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Do you ever wonder why people commit suicide? It's a grief that has no hope. You see, the person who commits suicide comes to several conclusions that are not necessarily wrong in themselves. I'm messed up, and nothing can straighten me out. If at that point they could turn to Christ, that would be what we're talking about here, the impoverished spirit resulting in that mourning over that condition before God. That's where repentance comes from. And that's why the passage says, why Christ himself says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And you look at this and you say, why future? Why shall be comforted? The Greek is interesting because the future is often used for more than just something future. It's also used for certainty. And we do that as well. We talk about things that will certainly happen. I will, I will surely do this or that. It's a future tense, but we're, we're intending not to say that it's just future time, but rather this is a certainty. This is going to happen. But I think this is also something in the, uh, in, in the Greek pra- phrasing here that is illustrating a continual mourning followed by continual comfort. Because the mourning doesn't stop when you trust Christ as your Savior, I hope. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, to confess is to say the same thing as God says. How can we confess except to mourn what we've done, what we've thought, what we've said? So there is this continual mourning that produces continual comfort. This comfort begins right now. It begins right now at the point of a person's coming to salvation. And that comfort comes as the knowledge of sin, not only present but forgiven, comes to us. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about some of these blessings. Verse 7 says that we have in Christ our sins forgiven. But not only that, the knowledge of being accepted in the beloved one, in the merits of Christ, to know that you are in Christ is one of the greatest treasures and privileges that anyone can be afforded. Trust me, it's better than having having the largest bank account imaginable. Because with that comes grief. How do I keep it? How do I keep it from the government? and thieves. But when you're in Christ, there is nothing that can separate you from him. And then Christ promised the presence of the comforter. He says, when I'm gone, the comforter, the Holy Spirit will come. And if you know what it is to have the comforter residing within you, you know that you have the strength you need to get through whatever challenge life may throw at you. This comfort then endures throughout affliction. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 talks about our light and momentary affliction. Now, the apostle is writing to individuals who are going through anything that we could, other than what you could think of as light and momentary. These are individuals going through grave persecution who are suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. And yet, he says, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So it's not that he is making light of the affliction. He's saying there's something that is so far greater than the affliction that it makes it seem light. It makes it just momentary because how long will the glory that we will share with Christ last? Forever. So that's described as this weighty glory because it will last forever. 
And then the comfort is assurance for eternity. You know, a salvation that only saves you for now is worthless. A salvation that only saves you till your next sin is worthless. It's only a salvation that lasts forever that's of any value. If it's not eternal life, then it's not life at all. But that's what God promises us, eternal life. There are two passages of Scripture that I want to bring to your attention here that are just absolutely precious. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may tarry for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That's not saying go to bed tonight, it'll be better in the morning. It's not take two aspirin, call me later. This is God's statement that on the other side of death's door, because this life is the night, or as someone has said, this life is the closest a believer will ever get to hell. It's also the closest that an unbeliever will ever get to heaven. And this ain't heaven. But what it says is that we have this opportunity coming for us. Notice this night and the morning, sort of the idea of those who sleep in Christ. At the end of the sleep, I'm not talking about soul sleep. It's just a body sleep because our soul goes immediately into the presence of God. But in the meanwhile, those who are in heaven are without a body. Scripture makes that very clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you want to reference? But when the resurrection happens and we get our glorified body, that's the hope that we as believers have, that glorified body and that eternal residence in heaven. The second verse I want to direct your attention to is Isaiah 51, verse 11. And the ransom that the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. What an amazing promise the Word of God gives us. That those who sorrow now under the weight of their own sin and the weight of society's sin, all of that combining will one day see sorrow and sadness flee away. On that day when we're in the presence of God, there will be no more tears in our eyes. Scripture says the former things will have passed away. God will have made all things new. And even the memory of those that we have known in this life who did not know Jesus Christ will either be erased or altered to the point that we see it from God's perspective. And there still will be no sorrow. That's the ultimate comfort. The comfort begins now, but it continues on through eternity and only gets better. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Who are the meek? those who learn the gentleness of Jesus Christ from their master. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Have you ever faced something that was so overwhelming and so emotionally shattering that you thought you couldn't bear it? Have you ever come to these verses and said, Lord, I need your rest? I am weary. I am heavy laden. God, give me rest. I've cried those words to God. Because when your heart is in turmoil and there is no rest, it doesn't matter how many people pat you on the back and say it'll be okay. What you really need is the ministry of God's Holy Spirit. And friends, that can happen outside of the death of a family member. That can happen just simply because you realize you've wasted time. You've wasted opportunities. 
You haven't grown like God wants you to grow. And as a result, you're in this situation that you just can't quite find a way out of. And you turn to God. Give me your peace. I challenge you. If you're facing whatever you're facing and it's just eating you up inside, take these verses to the Lord in prayer and pray over them. Let the tears flow. Because Christ says, you will find rest for your souls. Blessed are the meek. The meek is speaking of a mild spirit that governs anger and revenge. How careless we can be with our words. I remember as a, I don't know if I was even a teenager at that point, family Christmas gathering. My grandmother, not by blood, but by marriage into the family, a dear saint, gave me a paperweight that had in, inside the paperweight two globes, one an ancient map of the world and the other a more modern rendering. And in my childish exuberance, fighting the Cold War on my own, I said, well, if God would just send a blast and take out the USSR, everything would be better. My grandmother said to me, this is Christmas gathering, remember, she says, but doesn't Jesus love them too? And it struck a note of conviction in my heart that I was passing judgment where I had no right to pass judgment. Sometimes as Christians who know the word of God or should know the word of God, we make statements that just are inconscionable. I was about to say unforgivable. Fortunately, in God's sight, they're not unforgivable. But I have heard some very harsh statements coming from Christians' mouths. Yes, and from my own. We need to repent of that and adopt this meekness of spirit that governs anger with the meekness of Christ. Meekness is also the idea of taming, being tamed by the spirit of God. We have a raging nature within us that wants to destroy, that wants to mar the image of God that is hateful, that is spiteful, that is unloving, thoroughly ugly. And it is only the grace of God that comes to change that. The person who is impoverished in spirit, who mourns for that in repentance, should become this meek one whose strength is under the control of God. Meekness also includes the idea of a willingness to suffer wrong rather than inflicting or wishing injury on another. And that can be in word or in deed. Many times we say things and say, well, I'd never do it. Then why do you say it? Why do I say it? I mean, I don't want this to be just pointed at you. Meekness. An absence of resentment and bitterness. Hebrews 12 verse 15 tells us, So see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Friends, don't be the root of bitterness. Don't have the bitter word, the vengeful spirit, because it won't just affect you. It will affect those around you. I try to correct that spirit in myself and in others because it is wrong. It is sin. And it will drag us far away from God's purpose for us and may well cause the damning of another eternal soul to hell. We should take these things seriously. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Just think about it. The world doesn't teach us that. The humility, the mildness of character. No, we're told that even as Christians, you need to use profanity because that's the only way people know you're serious. 
Where's the meekness? The meekness, the meek will inherit the earth. And yet we look around ourselves at the world around us and we see individuals getting away with murder. We complain about it. And we'd love to see the tables turned. In fact, we look at around us and most of the wealth is, of the world is held by whom? Individuals who know or do not know Jesus Christ. The ones who do not know Jesus Christ. So the wicked seem to hold the wealth of the world, but actually it belongs to the merciful. Read Psalm 37, 9 through 11. Gives us this very certain perspective. Don't look at what's going on around you because God will change that. Here are the verses. The evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully for his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. You see, God hasn't just said this once. He says it over and over again. And it's for us to believe it. The meek have a focus, though, that is on heaven. They're not just thinking about this earth. God provides their needs in spite of what may be absolute poverty on their case. Though poverty is their lot, they possess everything. 2 Corinthians 6.10, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. It's a series of contrasts that the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, presents to us. How is it possible to be poor, yet making many rich? Well, if it's a poverty in spirit... We can make many rich by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others who need it just as much as we do. As having nothing yet possessing all things, having nothing is the experience of many believers. We may think ourselves like them, but not nearly like Hebrews chapter 11 describes some who went around begging literally because of their faith in God and their faith in Christ. Reminds us, Scripture says, you have not yet resisted unto blood. In other words, it's not as bad as it could be. It doesn't matter what you're facing. Meek, they will inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or are hungering and thirsting for righteousness because it's, again, a present tense idea. This is something that goes on again and again, just as these others here in the grammar, we see it as well. This begins with a desire to know the salvation that God offers us. That's the initial step of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. If you don't come through that door, if you don't come through Christ, if you're not the poor in spirit, and therefore you don't mourn over your sinfulness, you never learn the meekness of Christ, then the hungering and thirsting for righteousness is a vain idea. Most people just simply want their neighbors to be nice, right? If I could just have a neighbor that didn't do X or Y. I've had those neighbors. I had a neighbor, seemed at least, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm accusing wrongly, but there was always trash in my yard in his corner of the property. I don't know that squirrels, well, they didn't have squirrels in Puerto Rico. Some said they did in the mountains, but I never saw one. The mongoose, whatever other critters, I don't think they were bringing the trash. Never did figure out what the deal was, but that isn't really the major need that that neighbor had, so I never even addressed it. The gospel was the need, and that is what has to be addressed. Unless a person understands the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how many of the Ten Commandments they think they keep. It's not a contest. In fact, if you want to make it a contest, God says, fine, we'll make it a contest. You want me to weigh all your works when you get to the end of life? I'll do that. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're outside of Christ, you never win that. You never come out ahead. You never keep enough Ten Commandments to make up for the ones you don't keep. In fact, the Word of God posits that you never keep any of them. 
Wow. That's a blow to our confidence, isn't it? And unless there is within us a spiritual hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God, we'll never come to Him for salvation. But the intensity of the desire that is being related here is important to note. For most of us, when you get really good and hungry, what do you do? Find a way to solve it at 1 o'clock in the morning. You with me? Exactly. Why? Because I don't like this feeling. That's why diets are so nasty. I know they're of the devil. They always leave you hungry. But what, anyway. Spiritually speaking, why don't more people come to Christ? Because they don't want it. They don't hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not something they want. They think of it as, well, if I, if I get what you got, I won't be able to have any fun. There goes life. Life's not worth living without fun. If righteousness doesn't rise to a higher level than fun, in our estimation, we'll never even have salvation. And how sad it is that many people have made professions of faith without any desire for righteousness. And those professions of faith don't result in anything of change in their lives. They continue living like the child of hell they were before they made the profession of faith, yet they want to consider themselves a believer. And Scripture says, by their fruit you will know them. I can make a righteous judgment. First John says, if someone says, I am walking in the light and they're actually walking in darkness, they're a liar. So there are a lot of individuals going around thinking that they're on their way to heaven and they're going to be rudely surprised when they show up before the great white throne judgment. They're going to be the ones that call out, Lord, how in the world am I here? Don't you remember the things that I did? I walked that aisle. I had picked up the trash. I cleaned the toilet. You know, I did something. And God will say, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. There was never a desire. There was never hunger or thirst after righteousness, so there was no satisfaction. Of course, this speaks of a continual desire to know and to practice what is right. And so for those of us who know Christ and our lives have shown some change over the years, there is for us the challenge to continually have that hunger and thirst for righteousness that drives us back to the Word of God, that drives us to church attendance, not when convenient, but constantly. I need this. I rejoice when I hear someone saying, I just love to hear the word. I love to be in the word. It's not always comfortable, but I need it. I don't always leave church feeling good about myself, but at least I know that I've been given truth. And that's important. Colossians 3.2 tells us we're to set our minds on things which are above and not on things on the earth. And Hebrews 6 tells us of those who have tasted of the Word of God. They've tasted of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they've gotten close. They've gotten a little bit of a sample. And yet they turn away from it and are never able to be brought back to a true knowledge of Christ as Savior. It is possible to get so close to salvation that you can almost taste it and yet be lost. What's your appetite, your spiritual appetite like? These individuals, we're told, will be satisfied. To be satisfied is to have your need met, what you cry out for. And so most people in this life, they get what they want. If you want a fleshly life, that's what you get, because that's what you pursue. And frankly, I'm, I'm shocked to hear what some individuals who claim the name of Christ participate in in the way of entertainment. Entertainment is not innocent. Entertainment is indoctrination. I hope you're aware of that. Entertainment is all about changing your mind. And if you're not careful, it'll change your mind away from biblical truth. 
A steady diet of this world's entertainment will kill any hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's your choice. You get what you want. And so these individuals will be satisfied. It's talking about God continually supplying the soul's desire, continually providing what the soul desires in the way of righteousness. That comes first of all, of course, through salvation. And so that's the first point of satisfaction. When you truly know yourself to be forgiven by God, to be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, not because of your good works, but by the substitution of your bad works with Christ's good works. That imputation, that counting to your record what Christ has done on the cross is what gives salvation. Jesus said in John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's talking about that initial satisfaction for hunger, uh, for um, righteousness that is satisfied by our coming to Christ. And in the sense of being a, a sinner or a sinner saved by grace, that's a one-time experience. We come to God, we come for that forgiveness, and we have that satisfaction. But there's also something in Scripture that talks about being satisfied by sanctification. And again, this is one of those things that's missing in a lot of believers' ways of thinking. To be satisfied in sanctification is talking about the outworking of the fruit of the Spirit. I'm sure you're aware that... Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, give us a list of the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. In other words, the evidence of the Spirit in our life. If there isn't evidence of those things in our lives, we have no reason to call ourselves a believer. But there is every reason to enhance those different qualities and grow in them as well. That's part of sanctification. Peter talks about adding to our faith various elements. That's the idea. And one day we will be satisfied forever by adoption or glorification. Two passages of Scripture to illustrate this point. From Romans chapter 8, verses 23 and 24, we understand that our hunger and thirst right now is expressed in Scripture as a groaning. Look at those verses with me. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have the fruit of the Spirit there. It's part of who we are. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons. That is the redemption of our bodies when we get to glorification. That's this adoption. For in this hope, that hope of being glorified, of being transformed from the sinner's that we still are in practice to being absolutely the image of Jesus Christ. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? In other words, there's no expectation of a future fulfillment if you already have the fulfillment now. That's how we know that adoption and glorification haven't happened, as if you needed that proof. But there are many who talk about adoption. I've been adopted into God's family. That's not the biblical teaching. Biblical teaching is the adoption is still in the future. It happens when we're in the presence of God. How do you get into the family of God? Nobody's adopted into the family of God. We all have to be born into it. What was it Christ said to Nicodemus? You must be born again. The new birth is the only way in. Adoption, or literally son placing, is when we have all the rights and privileges of a child of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's when we're in heaven. That's when we actually possess everything we've been promised. In one other verse, Psalm 17, 15, talks about our being fully satisfied when we awake with Christ's likeness. Now, I know the word Christ is not in Psalm 17. But we're taking this with New Testament revelation, and we understand that's what's being talked about here in Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness, for the person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, 
When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Does that send a chill up your spine? Absolute satisfaction only happens when we're in the presence of God, wearing the image of Jesus Christ, having been transformed completely into the likeness of God's dear Son. What an amazing prospect awaits the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, and those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. So think about these things. Christianity changes our value system completely. Would you agree? I'm not talking about a worldly Christianity. I'm not talking about a Christianity in name only. I'm talking about true embracing of the doctrines of Scripture. It changes how we look at life. You see, each of these values that we've talked about this morning, each of these first four Beatitudes is viewed in one way or another as a sign of weakness in the world. And even many Christians seem to share that opinion. But the Scriptures tell us that present and eternal blessing rests on this work of grace in our life. If you haven't been down this road of the impoverished spirit because of your bankruptcy, that your absolute sinfulness before God, and then the mourning that results from that and is actually the repentance that we've spoken of, that produces a meekness. I have nothing to boast about before God. I am nothing before Him. And a continual hungering and thirsting after righteousness. If these things are not in you and if they do not abound... Don't consider yourself a true Christian. That's the safest course I can advise for you. There are far too many people thinking they're going to heaven, think they have their ticket punched. They aren't going to be there. Someone asked the question, if the rapture were to happen this week, how many people would be in attendance here next Sunday? Hmm. I trust we do know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we're talking about serious and yet joyful issues. Things that bring us rapture as we think of all of the blessings that you have in store for those who truly love you. And on the other hand, there should be a shuddering of fear in the heart of any without absolute certainty of faith in Jesus Christ. May no one leave here unchanged. May all of us know the reality of truth impacting our lives. And Lord, may we humble ourselves before that truth. We thank you for each person gathered here today those who will hear the message online, perhaps now, perhaps later in the day or in the week. We ask that your word would work powerfully, that your spirit would empower these words to bring conviction, faith, and eternal life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ray, would you please come and lead us in the final hymn, and then after that I'll have a few words uh, to say as we change our uh, track. In the big white hymn supplement book, number 14, Not in Me is the title, number 14. In advance warning, you have to turn the page for verse 3. Let's stand together as we sing together, Not In Me. No rest of sins I have not done, no list of virtues I pursue, no list of those I 
am not like can earn myself a place with you. Oh God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner through and through. My only hope of righteousness is not in me, but only you. No humble dress, no fervent prayer, no lifted hands, no tearful song, no recitation of the truth can justify a single wrong. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary love was borne by him, and he alone can give me rest. No separation from the world, no work I do, no gift I give can cleanse my conscience, cleanse my hands. I cannot cause my soul to live. But Jesus died and rose again. The power of death is overthrown. My God is merciful to me and merciful in Christ alone. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary love was born by him, and he alone can give me rest. And he alone can give